Everyone lives by faith. The question is, is your faith reasonable? The Irrational Faith of Evolution, this week on Creation Magazine Live. Welcome to Creation Magazine Live. My name is Richard Fangrad. And I'm Calvin Smith. Now, this week on Creation Magazine Live, our topic is the irrational faith of evolution. That's right. Last year we did an episode <laughs> called Everyone Lives by Faith. And we outlined four different kinds of faith. And if you missed the TV uh, broadcast, you can uh, view it online at creation.com slash CML523. And we're basically going to continue that topic, uh, diving more deeply into the kind of faith required for evolution. Right. Uh, let's start by reviewing the four kinds of faith. And, and by the way, there are other ways to organize all the different kinds of faith. We've just gone with these four kinds just for simplicity's sake. Uh, you may be able to think of other variations. So the highest level of faith could be called biblical faith. Right. Uh, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 describes this kind of faith. It says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God not a result of works, so that no one may boast. So, biblical faith doesn't originate with us. It's not your own doing, right? It, it's not the result of works. Saving faith is a gift from God. Right. The next kind or, or level of faith, and, and this is the kind that everyone has, is warranted faith or human faith. It's a faith warranted by evidence or experience. Uh, for example, if, if you, you have a warranted faith, when you go to a restaurant, you eat the food they put in front of you, uh, and you have faith that it's not going to kill you. That's the kind of faith we're talking about here, warranted faith. Right. And we could mention that this kind of faith is related to apologetics. Right. Right. Yeah. So uh, giving a reasoned defense for, for biblical truths. But apologetics goes beyond human faith. It involves actively connecting evidence to show that the statements made by God and the events recorded in the Bible are logical and true. You could call that reasonable faith. Um, it, it's slightly uh, in a slightly different category of faith that isn't included in the four that we're discussing today. Right. Uh, blind faith is the next kind of faith. Blind faith is a leap into the dark. Uh, there's no evidence or experience to warrant this kind of faith. Now, Christians are often caricatured as having this kind of faith. Uh, most non-Christians think that we, you know, check our brains at the church door kind right. of thing and ignore logic and reason, and that's what Christianity is all about. Not true, of course, but there you have the third kind of faith. Right. And the, the fourth, and we could uh, say that this is the lowest level of faith, is right. irrational yeah. faith. It's defined as having faith in something in spite of evidence against it. So it, it goes a step further than blind faith. With blind faith, uh, evidence is ignored. But with irrational faith, you're aware of evidence, not blind to it, and you believe the opposite of what the evidence points to. Right. In the previous episode, we mentioned Mark Twain, the famous author who wrote... <laughs> Faith is believing what you know ain't so. That's irrational faith. You know something, yet you believe the opposite. Right. For example, if you're, you're at the edge of a cliff, you know that thin air is not going to support the weight of a human, yet you step off the cliff anyways, believing that somehow you're not going to fall to your death. Yeah, well, that's, that's crazy, right? Yes. And, and yet that, that's the kind of faith that, that's the most accurate way to describe the faith required for evolution. Um, in the previous episode, we gave a couple of examples to verify this, and we're going to have to uh, get, more into the, get more into this in the next half hour. But these are examples where scientific observations point one way, and the evolutionist believes the opposite. That's right. Yeah, one of them is the origin of life, often called abiogenesis, or chemical evolution. Evolutionists believe with all their hearts that life arose from chemicals that were not alive. Right. Uh, but science, on the other hand, has never once shown this to be the case. In fact, there's massive scientific evidences to confirm one of the most 
<laughs> fundamental axioms in biology that all life comes from pre-existing life. Exactly. This goes back to experiments by Francesco Reddy, an Italian physician who proved that maggots come from living flies and not from lifeless meat, as was widely believed at the time. That was in the mid-1600s. Yeah. Uh, it was a, a serious setback to the belief in spontaneous generation. But later, when bacteria were discovered, spontaneous generation believers thought microorganisms might arise from non-life. And of course, that notion was disproved in 1864 by the great scientist and creationist Louis Pasteur, yes. who demonstrated that bacteria can only come from living bacteria, and we'll continue with more of that when we, uh, when we get back after this short break. Did you know that the DNA code is itself governed by another code known as the epigenetic code? This physical and chemical code determines which genes are switched on. Changes in this code can greatly alter an organism without altering one letter of its DNA. For instance, scientists have managed to change the coat color in mice by feeding them a diet that switches off certain genes. Epigenetics poses new problems for evolution. For instance, a group of animals with a camouflaged coat color might be favored in a particular environment. But if this coat color is due to epigenetics and not the actual DNA code, then the non-camouflaged animals would be selected against in vain. When the epigenetic modification is reset by a diet change, natural selection is sent back to square one. The field of epigenetics therefore creates problems for evolution and strongly points to a master programmer who invented the DNA and epigenetic codes. To find out more from Creation Ministries International, visit our website, creation.com. Well, if you just tuned in, we're, uh, this week we're talking about the irrational faith of evolution. Irrational faith, yeah. all right. Continuing with, uh, with Pasteur's discoveries, when he reported on his results before the French Academy, he confidently declared that never will the doctrine of spontaneous generation recover from the mortal blow of this simple experiment. There is no known circumstance in which it can be confirmed that microscopic beings came into the world without germs, without parents similar to themselves. Now, Pasteur never dreamed that the widely discredited evolutionary ideas at the time of Charles Darwin, who, who lived at the same time just, and, and just a few years earlier had published his famous Origin of Species, would one day become widely accepted by the scientific community, reviving the notion of spontaneous generation. Exactly. Some people say that Pasteur's spontaneous generation has nothing to do with chemical evolution. Well, that's not true. And knowledgeable evolutionists know it. That's right. Uh, in his book, The Origins of Life, evolutionist Cyril Ponimpature uh, said this, It is perhaps ironic that we tell beginning students in biology about Pasteur's experiments as the triumph of reason over mysticism. Yet we are coming back to spontaneous generation, albeit in a more refined and scientific sense, namely to chemical evolution. Okay, so, so what do we have here? Yeah. Science says life begets life, yep. that life does not come from non-life, yet what do evolutionists believe? They believe the exact opposite of that. That's irrational faith. faith. Yeah. Uh, famous evolutionist George Wald, who, who won the Nobel Peace Prize in Science, said this, when it comes to the origin of life on this earth, there are only two possibilities, creation or spontaneous generation. There is no third way. Spontaneous generation was disproved 100 years ago, but that leads us to only one other conclusion, that of supernatural creation. We cannot accept that on philosophical grounds. Therefore, I love this last part, yeah. we choose to believe the impossible, that life arose by chance. Right. It's philosophical grounds, not scientific grounds yes. that they're, they're yeah. rejecting. Irrational. This. Evolutionists try hard to get around the science with things like the, the Miller-Urey experiment back yes. in 1952. But that only produced amino acids, and, uh, and, and they were the wrong kinds of amino acids anyway. It, yeah. it, it didn't come anywhere close to reproducing life. Now today, there's still no observational support that life could come from non-life. There are some interesting recent experiments where intelligent designers have made changes to existing life or taken parts of existing life to make different life, yeah. but there's no science to overturn the law of abiogenesis. That's right. Uh, this is an area where science, all the evidence points one way, mm -hmm. but evolutionists believe the opposite. It's anti-scientific and it's firmly in the category of irrational faith. Right. Now on the other hand, for, for Christians, science confirms that life cannot arise through uh, the natural laws that God put in place to govern the universe. Yes. The most logical and reasonable conclusion it is, that, is that something above natural laws, something supernatural, must have been involved to, to create life, 
And that's a reasonable faith. It makes sense. Yeah. We have a reasonable faith. Let, let's look at another example. Uh, the famous discoveries by paleontologist Dr. Mary Schweitzer of various kinds of dinosaur soft tissue. Right. Now, remember, the evolutionary or millions of years history of the universe places the earliest dinosaurs at about 233 million years ago. That's a long time ago. Yeah. And, then, and the most recently living dinosaurs at about 65 million years ago. But no one was there to verify that those things happened at those times, so it's just a belief about the past. Right, yeah. The Bible, on the other hand, is a record about the past, recorded in many cases by people who were there and ultimately kept free from error by the Holy Spirit anyway. Right. Uh, a straightforward interpretation of the text, just drawing the meaning from the words that are there, not trying to twist it to mean something else, reveals that God created recently not billions or even millions of years ago. Yeah, Dr. Schweitzer's discoveries uh, back in the 90s of T-Rex blood cells in a T-Rex leg bone shocked evolutionists. Yes. Bible believers, on the other hand, were provided with yet one more evidence that supports biblical history, that dinosaurs were created recently and died recently. Died recently as well, yeah. These discoveries are a, a huge threat to evolution or anyone who believes the millions of years time frame because everyone knows that biological structures like blood cells and blood, cell, blood vessels and soft tissue and, and meat and skin and, and things like that don't last millions of years. Yep. Animals that die uh, in the wild, for example, or are hit by, by vehicles on the side of the road, uh, they rot away in weeks or months. Uh, so finding blood cells in unfossilized dinosaur bones, and they were unfossilized, yep. is a major problem if you believe in millions of years. Right. For details on this, you can find, uh, you can read our report on it at creation.com slash dino dash blood. And when we get back, we'll talk about more soft tissue found in dinosaurs since this discovery. The Genesis account is the Rolls Royce of creation books. It's a thorough verse-by-verse -verse analysis of the first 11 chapters of Genesis, revealing what the text means. Unlike most commentaries, it includes the additional step of providing cutting-edge scientific support for the history recorded in Genesis, because its author, Dr. Jonathan Safady, is a PhD scientist. Since science confirms the truths in God's Word, if both are properly interpreted, this nearly 800-page book makes a fantastic reference tool for pastors or anyone wanting to know what Genesis really means. Order your copy at creation.com. On this week's episode, we're talking about the irrational faith of evolution, how belief in the evolutionary history of the universe, beginning with a, a Big Bang and, and billions of years later you end up with people, is not a reasonable faith, it's not a warranted faith, it's not even a blind faith, it's at the extreme end of the faith spectrum. It's a belief that goes in the opposite direction to that which is suggested by evidence. Yeah, the evolutionary belief that dinosaurs died, you know, millions of years ago is an irrational belief. It is. It yeah. goes against science, against what scientists observe. After Dr. Schweitzer, we mentioned earlier, published papers revealing what she found, evolutionists attempted to discredit the findings, saying that they, they weren't blood cells. But they were tested in a variety of ways, and they really are blood cells. Yeah, then yeah. then in, in 2005, she found more blood cells along with soft tissue and uh, different kinds of dinosaur proteins. It just gets better and better. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what, what she found shocked even her because she believes dinosaurs died millions of years ago. She said, she said this, it was totally shocking. I didn't believe it until we'd done it 17 times. The tests. That's great. <laughs> Uh, but, but it's not surprising that a new scientific discovery shocked her because the, the science opposes her beliefs. Mm -hmm. In fact, shocking discoveries are going to be the norm for anybody who believes falsehoods about the true history of the universe. Right, and it wasn't just uh, Dr. Schweitzer who, who was shocked. Other evolutionists were even more shocked to the point where she actually had problems getting uh, papers published. Yeah, uh, yeah. She said, uh, I had one reviewer tell me he didn't care what the data said. He knew what I was finding wasn't possible, said Schweitzer. I wrote back and said, well, what data would convince you? And he said, none. That's pretty scientific, eh? La, 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 la. It's, it's, it's <laughs> kind of like that, yeah. I mean, that illustrates a fascinating part of the origins debate, yep. that it isn't about the data. I mean, it has to do with the data, but at a foundational level, look at this example. Yep. The debate <laughs> is between different beliefs about history. This reviewer believes that dinosaurs died millions of years ago, and his belief causes him to reject 
scientific observations. That's fascinating. Yeah, it's an irrational. It's, it's an irrational. It is, yeah. yeah, yeah. And it, it's, it's kind of ironic, too, because creationists, of course, are often accused of rejecting science. Sure, yeah, you hear that all the time. Yeah, we don't reject science. There isn't a single scientific observation that creationists reject. What we reject is the false millions of years history that the scientific observations are often wrapped in. Right, yeah. This discovery is a good example. Um, we don't reject the observation, dinosaur soft tissue, uh, blood cells, protein, etc. We reject the interpretation that these things are 70 million years old. Uh, for more details on Dr. Schweitzer's amazing research, see this article, creation.com slash Schweitz. And yeah. there's a lot of good stuff there. But, but there's even more. <laughs> yeah. Dinosaur DNA was found uh, and uh, reported on again by Dr. Schweitzer. DNA. And her team. Yeah, they detected DNA in three independent ways. Amazingly, one of the chemical tests and another test using specific antibodies detected DNA still in its double-stranded form. So it was quite well preserved since uh, short strands of, of, of DNA, less than about 10 uh, BP or base pairs, don't form stable duplexes, the DNA structure that these tests detected. Right, well, one test involved using what's called a stain to check if the DNA still has an intact double helical structure, double helix structure. The stain will lodge itself into the groove in the double helical structure like you can see here, and that was confirmed. Of course, again, the, the first possible response um, by, by long ages is contamination from right. bacteria, yeah. for example, or, or that it's only biofilm. But the DNA wasn't found uh, everywhere. It was only in certain internal regions of the cells. That's unlike biofilm taken from other sources and exposed to the same DNA detecting pattern. Biofilm is any group of microorganisms where cells stick to each other and often stick to some other surface. Yeah, that's biofilm. Uh, but it also rules out bacteria because in more complex cells, such as us and, and dinosaurs, yeah. uh, the DNA is stored in a small part of the cell, the cell, the, the nucleus, of course. Right. In addition to that, Schweitzer's team detected a special protein called histone H4. Not only can uh, this protein not last for millions of years, but this is a specific protein for DNA. In more complex organisms, the histones uh, are, are tiny spools around which the DNA is wrapped, but histones aren't found in bacteria. Right. Yeah, so there are more details. Uh, you can read about them at creation.com slash dino DNA, and the original papers are referenced in our article. Uh, the bottom line is, intact dinosaur DNA has been discovered. How long could it last under ideal conditions? We'll give you the answer when we get back. Have the fish in New York's Hudson River evolved into super mutants? A large proportion of the river's Atlantic tomcod fish have developed resistance to certain poisons, and the mass media has heralded this as a dramatic example of evolution in action. However, far from supporting microbes to man evolution, these mutant fish have actually devolved, not evolved. That's because the fish have become resistant through a loss of genetic information. Non-resistant fish have special proteins in their cells that allow the poisons to bind. However, due to a genetic mutation, the proteins of resistance Resistant fish cannot bind the poisons as readily, so corrupted proteins have made the fish resistant. And in the poison-rich environment of the Hudson River, it's no wonder that the mutated gene facilitating resistance has quickly spread throughout the tomcod population. It is misleading to call these changes evolution, because evolution requires the addition of new genetic information. But these resistant fish have only demonstrated information loss. To find out more from Creation Ministries International, visit our website, creation.com. All right, our subject this week is the irrational faith of evolution. Mm. Scientific observations strongly favor the biblical creation account that God created recently in six literal days and there was a global flood. Yeah, but evolutionists have to believe in millions of years. Uh, evolutionary history, uh, in spite of the evidence against it, and that's irrational faith, but yeah. they have to cling to it. Yes. So, dinosaur DNA has been discovered. Mm -hmm. uh, that is shocking to evolutionists. Their first response, of course, was to question the data, but it's been confirmed that scientists really are finding dinosaur DNA. Mm -hmm. So, some brave scientists took it upon them themselves to investigate the question, how long could dinosaur DNA last? That's the big question. Yeah, a, a paper on DNA by evolutionists from December 2012 shows that it might be able to last as much as 400 times longer in bone. Oh, yeah, that's interesting, yeah. yeah. But, but even there, there's no way that DNA could last since the evolutionary time of dinosaur extinction 
they're figures of the, of, of the time until complete disintegration of DNA, which is no intact bonds, is the following. 22,000 years at 25 degrees Celsius, 131,000 years at 15 degrees Celsius, 882,000 years at 5 degrees Celsius, and even if it could somehow be kept continually below freezing at minus 5 degrees Celsius, it could survive only 6.83 million years, and that's about a tenth of the assumed evolutionary age of dinosaurs. Yeah, just doesn't work. Yeah. So according to the evolutionary history, uh, dinosaurs died about 65 million years ago. Science says, no, they didn't. <laughs> <laughs> What are you going to go with? Yeah, the history or the or the science? I feel like asking evolutionists. Do, do you think we should throw out all of forensic science, or just <laughs> when dealing with dinosaurs? Like it, it, it might seem. It, it, we might also mention uh, that science supports the history recorded in Scripture. Mm -hmm. I mean, fun stuff. I, I I love being a Christian. It makes so much sense. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> you know. Christianity makes sense of the world around us. It if does. you begin yep. your thinking with what God says in the Bible, these kinds of discoveries aren't a problem. It's reasonable to have faith in what the Bible says. Right, yeah. Let's look at another one. Mutations. Genetic mutations are changes to the genetic code. The genetic code is like software that tells the hardware what to do. Right. Well, Bill Gates, the, the computer genius behind Microsoft, yes. actually said DNA is like a computer program, but far, far more advanced than any software ever created. And he's right. Scientists are continually discovering more and more complexity to the genetic code, to the point where comparing it to a computer code is actually far too simplistic. It's actually yeah. mind-bogglingly complex. <laughs> yes. All living things have this complex code within their cells that governs how the cells operate. Mutations are errors in that code that originate primarily as the DNA is copied. Every time there's cell division, when the DNA makes a copy of itself, there's about three errors that are produced. Right. And we start life as a, as a single cell inside mom with a, a single copy of our DNA. Then that single cell divides, eventually becoming the trillions of cells we are today. Some of the mutations that occur during all this uh, copying are passed on to the next generation so that each new generation starts life off with more mutations than the previous generation. Now, decades ago, scientists were concerned, or alarmed really, that the rate at which mutations accumulate in the human population from generation to generation might be as high as one mm. in every single generation. They were concerned because if the mutation rates were that high, the human race would be doomed to extinction. It's just a matter of time. Right. These mutations are destroying the complex code that governs how your body works. So yeah. soon the code isn't going to work anymore. That's right. Uh, great advances are being made in the study of genetics. It's an extremely fast-moving field of science. New discoveries happen all the time. So what are the leading human population geneticists saying today about mutation well, rates? It, well, it's not one mutation per generation. No. It's not two, and it's not five. It's around 100 to 300. Uh, now, here's what that would look like. Imagine that you know this is Adam and Eve, or a couple that lived long ago. Everyone in the next generation would have about 100 more mutations when they start life than their parents had when they started life. The next generation would start life off with about 200 more mutations. The third generation, 300. So, so how does this really relate to our subject here today? Yeah, evolutionists believe that humans have been evolving, going back to an, an ape-like ancestor about a million years ago. But science reveals that the human genome is deteriorating far too quickly. The notion that humans have been evolving for millions of years is a scientific impossibility. Exactly. Here's one more example where science points one direction and evolutionists believe exactly the opposite. That's right. Again, that kind of faith is an irrational faith. It's a belief that is held despite powerful, cutting-edge science against it. Right. Now, is this scientific discovery a problem for those who uh, take the Bible's history by faith? Not at all. There have only, you know, there have been less than 200 generations from Adam to us, about 6,000 years, not millions of years, and this data from genetics fits very well with biblical history. Yeah, actually, the more scientists study mutations, the more support they reveal for biblical creation. <laughs> and now, if you're interested in more information, go to creation.com slash mutations. That's going to take you to a page on our website with many articles summarizing the latest research on how mutations support the Bible. We'll be right back.
Creation Magazine is a 56-page full-color family magazine that is an essential tool for anyone wanting to immunize their family against the anti-biblical worldviews bombarding us from all sides. With no paid advertising, every page is full of powerful articles, ammunition to intelligently discuss nature, history, science, the Bible, and related subjects. Although written for lay people, every effort is made to ensure the content is technically accurate so that even experts are satisfied, and young children look forward to the section written especially for them. Visit creation.com to get your subscription. This week on Creation Magazine Live, the irrational faith of evolution. Yep. We were just talking about some uh, how some new discoveries in genetics powerfully refute the belief that humans have been evolving for millions of years. Now, some of you might be asking, so how do evolutionists get around this? Like, what's their response? Yeah, uh, Dr. John Sanford is the scientist who summarized much of this data in his amazing book, mm. Genetic Entropy and the Mystery of the Human Genome. Now, he himself is a geneticist, but not in the field of human population genetics. His book summarizes research from the leading human population geneticists, and they see the problem. Well, they sure do, because they write articles with titles like, Why Have We Not Died 100 Times Over? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> interesting. You know, they've gone through the data, and their answer is basically silence. Or, well, that's an interesting problem, isn't it? Yeah. The bottom line is, there's no answer for, for evolutionists. The, this data just doesn't fit with evolution. Right, yeah, Christianity makes some incredible claims that cause many not to investigate Christianity because they think the truth claims of the Bible are, that, that the Bible makes are just too far-fetched. Yep. But just because something sounds far-fetched doesn't mean it's not true. We shouldn't use that as a criteria for rejecting what the Bible says. Yes. For, for example, would you believe that you're moving at more than a million miles per hour right now? Mm -hmm. You know, it sounds pretty far-fetched, doesn't it? But it's true. If you take the rotational speed of the Earth at the equator, that's about 1,666 kilometers per hour, okay. and you add the speed of the Earth revolving around the Sun, the, the speed of the solar system revolving around the center of our galaxy, then you add the speed uh, that the Milky Way you know, moves through space uh, within the cluster of galaxies that uh, it, it's a member of, and this cluster moves through space towards yet another larger cluster of galaxies off uh, you know, in the dire direction of the constellation Virgo, Altogether, you're hurtling through space at about 4.4 million kilometers per hour or, or 2.7 million miles per hour, and you just feel like you're sitting still. Yeah, yeah. that seems far-fetched, but it's true. But it's true. I mean, referring to the, the incredible and sometimes complex claims made by the Bible, uh, uh, C.S. Lewis, the mm -hmm. famous writer of the Narnia series and, and other books, um, he, he wrote this. If Christianity was something we were making up, of course we could make it easier, but it is not. We cannot compete, compete in simplicity with people who are inventing religions. How could we? We are dealing with fact. Of course, anyone can be simple if he has no facts to bother about. Right. <laughs> you know, God created life. That might sound far-fetched, but it's true. Yeah. And science supports that conclusion, uh, you know, that the natural laws that we can investigate are insufficient to account that, for the origin of life. Right, yeah. Evolution makes uh, even more incredible claims than the Bible. It says that life can originate via the natural laws. But science says those natural laws say no. Absolutely. And, and I mean, the, the criteria that, that, well, just because something sounds far-fetched means we shouldn't investigate it. If you investigate the claims of the Bible, they hold up. If you investigate the claims of evolution, on the other hand, it doesn't work. Exactly. Yeah. You know, the information that we put together here on the show, Creation Magazine Live, is from the magazine, Creation Magazine, right. which has been published over 35 years now by Creation Ministries International. You can go to our website, creation.com slash free dash mag, and get yourself a free copy. And next week on Creation Magazine Live, Making Sense of Eight Man Claims. We'll see you then.